All right, we're here at the FAI headquarters in Abbottstown. The annual financial report was announced today, and I'm joined by the CEO of the FAI, John Delaney. Afternoon, John. Afternoon, Nathan. So this should be a very straightforward interview. We talk about the figures, we talk about revenue holding up, about the debt on the stadium coming down, yet all anybody wants to talk about is the statement last night and the ongoing row with the PFAI. Do you regret that statement being released last night and overshadowing what you feel is the good news story of today? Well, we'll come to that a little bit later. And I know, Frank Gavin, you're going to interview after mm. this interview about all the detail there. But let's, let's first of all deal with the finances. Let's deal with Drogheda United and the positive story about their new stadium. And we'll get to other questions after this. But, but it is difficult to talk about them when the only thing anyone wants to talk about is what happened with the PFAI. We had Stephen McGuinness on the show this morning. They're very upset about the statement, about not being consulted on the statement. Have you spoken to Steve McGuinness today? Do you plan to talk to him? Frank Gavin has all the detail about who knew what and when, and mm. he'll be bringing through all that detail. My role today is to talk about the finances, about the fact that 2017 was a very good year for the association, even though we didn't qualify for the major tournament in the World Cup. Uh, with a turnover of 49 million, our second highest ever. The debt on the Viva Stadium used to be 70 million. Uh, now it's below 30 million as of today and will be below 20 million next year and we have the capacity then to be debt free by 2020 and that's something that we'll outline to our members um, at the AGM in Cork next year. The other great story today is Drogheda United after many years looking for their, their, their obviously a new stadium for the club. Mm. I've been through that so many years with people like Vincent Hoey and club members. Uh, I was delighted that yesterday um, I spoke to Joan Martin, who's the CEO of Loud County Council. Uh, they had purchased extra land that was required to, to build the stadium and also do the recreational pitches. And it's a great news story that we can build a stadium that initially would be a 3,000-seater stadium and then build to a 10,000-seater stadium. That's a good news for Drogheda United Football Club. It's good news for Loud, but also it's great news for the SSE or Trusty League. The expectation within the figures then is that the revenue will hold fairly steady for 2018 as well and that the debt you may get it down below 20 million over the next year or so? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's first of all, it's our ninth profit in a row. That's why we've done nine, nine profits year after year in the last nine years. And we have a budget of profit for 2018, which I mean, we'll do 10 profits in mm. a row. And over that course, we've had to build an asset um, or build a stadium with the RFU that costs 410 million euros. Uh, our contribution, including government aid, was 210 million. Uh, we had to put 95 million of that 210 million in ourselves in hard money. And at one stage, that debt was 70 million. It's under 30 as we speak to you here today. It'll be under 20 million next year. And if we take the course and we'll present this to the members, we'll be debt free by, by, by 2020. All of that while we've been developing the game at grassroots level, as well as the women's football, as well as the league. So, Has that decision been made yet? Because I know even a year ago, you were feeling it was probably first six months of this year that the board would need to make a decision whether to repay the debt fully by 2020 or to invest more in grassroots and del delay the full repayment. Yeah, we have a board meeting today before the AGM, which is in Cork. Our AGM is in, is in Cork in August. Normally, traditionally, our AGM is in July. Mm. And we'll make that decision uh, prior to the, to the AGM and we'll announce that to, to our members. Is it hard on a day like this not to wonder what might have been when you look at the funding that is available for qualifying for a World Cup? There would have been a minimum of seven million. You've also, over the past year, lost the funding from Dennis O'Brien, which is another million. That's a lot of money that could have been there for the betterment of Irish football that's not. Yeah, I think to, 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 to take both, both points, um, we never do our budgets based on, quali based on qualifying for a major tournament. We've said that consistently. Um, our aim is to qualify for major tournaments, and our aim this time around is to qualify for our third Euros in a row. We qualified for 2012, 2016, and the aim is to qualify for 2020, when four of those games will be played in Dublin, and if we qualify, two of those games will be ours. So of course, when you look back in 2017, initial huge disappointment, we didn't get to the World Cup. When you go to the World Cup and you see the World Cup on your televisions, you want Ireland to be there, you want the Ireland sports to be there. But that's over now. And we have to look at the Nations League, which is coming in, in uh, October. We've got big games coming. We've got Wales and Denmark in the Nations League. We've got Northern Ireland in a friendly match in November. And we have the draw uh, being held in the Convention Centre in Dublin on the 2nd of December for Euro 2020. 140 million people will watch that live. Hopefully that draw is kind to us. It sets out the programme of matches through 2019 to get to a major tournament. And that's the aim of this organisation. When you mentioned the Dennis O'Brien um, situation, Dennis would have given us 12.5 million euros over a number of years 
to fund um, our senior international managers. But when we renewed our contracts this time round with Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane, the management, uh, we knew that Dennis's support would, would, um, would no longer be forthcoming. What he did was absolutely brilliant during the period that we needed him. But we made it very clear at the time when we announced that Dennis uh, wouldn't be funding us going forward on this particular piece that it was time for us to stand on our own two feet. So all that's factored into our budgets as well. Are you looking for further private investment or was that a one-off? That was a one-off. That was a one-off. I think we're always looking for investment in the game. If we can get more funding to, to invest in Irish football, that's the key. I think in a year that we didn't qualify for a major tournament, have a turnover of 49 million, and for it to be our second highest turnover, that shows that we can generate revenues. And that's a mix of UEFA TV money. It's a mix of... Um, obviously commercial revenues, it's a mix of tendencies at games, mix of government funding, um, mix of a range a range of different uh, revenues that we've generated through the years. So I mean, I think the, 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 real, the real point to put to you today is that we're in very good financial health, um, we'll be in better financial health this time next year and the key question that we will obviously put a position to, to our members at the AGM is whether we will be debt free by 2020, which is well within our capability to do. So we're going to talk to Frank Gavin in a minute and we can get into the nitty gritty yeah. of the ongoing issues with the PFAI. But the one question I think people have from the outside, particularly sitting here in Abbottstown today, you look around here, there's no way it's more than a two minute walk from your office to Stephen McGuinness's office. Yet you haven't met with the PFAI for well over a year at this stage. Why not? There's a structure in the FAI which Frank Gavin, who deals with competitions, there's uh, different departments in the organisation that deal directly, be it legal issues, financial issues, competitions issues. Frank Gavin deals with the PFAI in all matters. And when you interview him later, he'll give you an insight into the day-to-day -day workings that have been going on over the last period of time. But and you're I, the head of the association, John, and we've had an issue within the past month of players going up to two months without being paid in your league. Is that not a stage where you have to sit down, where your leadership is needed? to step in with the PFAI? Which we did with the clubs. So we sat with Limerick and we sat with Bray and all the players are now up to date. Just like I sat with Joan Martin about the redevelopment of the stadium in Drogheda, like I sat with Tim Lucy down in Cork about the Glanmire project and we sit with DCC about Daly Mount Park. They're the big strategy things that come across my desk and there's not a day that I don't deal with a League of Ireland matter but the structure of the organisation on operational matters, that's Frank Gavin's job to do and that's what he does and he'll outline that to you when he sees it later. But from a purely player's point of view, they have chosen the PFAI to represent them. Are you willing to talk to the PFAI? And We have a structure where Frank Gavin who's our director of competitions, deals directly with the PFAI, and that's the structure. That but are there not certain issues, when players are going two months without being paid, having to pay for their own operations, that that's a time where you as the CEO have to step in? That's when we stepped in and we dealt with Bray and Limerick directly, and as of today, um, there is no player's wages outstanding. That's the most important point to make. And if you look at last year, the salaries were nearly €6 million, Euros, the players, um, all paid. Licensing in general has been very good for the League of Ireland. Nothing, like I said earlier, VAR has had its issues in football. Mm. Licensing is not um, something that you say is it's, it's going to be 100% perfect, but it, it's done well for, for the league. Would and you accept them as a communication and, and, and issue? If you look at the industry over the last three years, the league clubs have generated 50 million euros. Mm. Okay, so it's, it's, it's an industry that we want to grow. But there's a structure in the organisation that deal with all these things. And when you speak to Fran, he'll, he'll outline to you in detail how that's going on operational. My role um, is to deal on strategy like Drogheda United, like Daly Mount Park, like Glanmire. And the biggest issue you know, for the league going forward from the FAI's perspective is the structure that will run the league going forward. And we want to, we've been sitting with the clubs for a period of time and we want an answer to that by, um, by December of this year so we can set out the strategy for the league going forward. This is the hybrid system that's been much mentioned. Mm. Both the clubs and the FAI run the league together. So handing some of the power back. Yeah, absolutely, and, and doing it in, in, in partnership together. And that's something that we would like the clubs to, to kind of come to a position with us by the end of summer. That's the biggest issue for me at the moment. It does feel as though issues like this, and they do crop up year on year, are undermining any of the good things that are happening. And I'm sure you'll talk about Dundalk tonight in the Europa League in Cork City yeah. and some of the success stories of the league. But these stories, they're what end up on Liveline, the players not being paid, that all the good things that are happening are undermined 
by this. So is it a communication problem that you're not getting the message across that you're dealing with the issues of Bray and Limerick? And, and why aren't the PFAI involved in those negotiations when you're talking with Bray as well? I, I think why hasn't that been fed back to the players through the PFAI? Well, see, we deal with the clubs directly and Fran deals with the PFAI. That's the way it cuts and that's the way it works. So, I mean, like, like you've just mentioned the good stories about, about Cork and Dundalk and Drogheda and all those. There's always going to be issues mm. in professional football. And that's not just in Ireland, that's across Europe. Okay. All I can say is that the league is in better shape over the last number of years than it was when we initially took it over. And the collective losses of the clubs, if you give you, remind you, used to be 7 million euros. When we took over the league, the collective loss of the clubs was 7 million euros. It's nothing like that now. And of course there are certain fragilities around certain clubs. There's also some clubs doing their business really, really well. And there are some clubs you know, who've got great projects. I mean, recently we, we supported Shamrock Rovers with 180,000 of a grant towards our Roadstone project. There is a lot of money being spent on Turner's Cross in terms of its development. I've mentioned Glenmire, I've mentioned Dalymont Park, and I've mentioned the great news about the Roddy United Football Club. So there is a lot of good stuff going on, mm. and there's no question about that. Even with the Under-19 National League, the Under-17 National League, the Under-15 National League, which started last year, the Under-13 National League that comes in this year, they're all positives, Nathan. But in there, there's always going to be something. Like a game of football, in the 90 minutes, judge the player on the game, there'll be a corner kick or a free kick or a yellow card or something that will go wrong on the pitch. But if you judge it on the 90 minutes, um, the league is making improvements and the clubs deserve a lot of credit for that. Along that journey, some of the clubs do experience difficulties, there's no doubt about that. But we dealt with that last week in both Limerick and Bray's case and all the players up to that. Do you feel it's simply impossible to put in place a fail-safe licensing system? Is that why this €300,000 fund is needed? That no matter if you do a full review, and I don't know if you have plans after this to look at the licensing system and whether it takes into account Bray's fa club's failings from a previous season and whether they need to reach a higher standard, do you feel that simply no matter what sort of process you have in place, issues could always crop up? There's no industry in Ireland that couldn't say that there wouldn't be an issue, but there's also a lot of positives. And even tomorrow there'll be a very positive announcement about one of the other League of Ireland clubs, and that'll come tomorrow. So I think what you've got to do is look at the overall picture Look at the overall strategy. The biggest issue for me and the FAI is who, where we will be with the clubs at the end of this year in terms of setting out a strategy for who runs the league going forward. Um, it is a clear preference identified between the clubs and ourselves to look at a hybrid system whereby both the league and uh, both the clubs and the FAI run the league, and that's the biggest issue I think looking forward mm. um, for, for the association and the clubs together. There's clearly issues between Fran and the PFAI at the moment, and the PFAI aren't particularly happy with their dealings with him. Does it just need you to step in, even if it's a one-hour meeting with the PFAI where everybody can clear the air and you can start again? Because this obviously isn't doing anybody any favours. I think, Nathan, you'll be speaking to Fran in a bit and you can go through every bit about what's gone over the last mm. week at an operation level. My view of strategy, and I've mentioned... Drada. So you don't intend on getting involved? Well, uh, well I think it's, there's somebody in Fran, Gavin, who's appointed to deal with those matters. No more than those people here to deal with legal matters and finance matters and high-performance matters. And I think when you interview Fran, he'll bring you through all of that. One more thing. You mentioned Turner's Cross, and we still don't have a resolution, it seems, to the Lee Miller tribute match, mm -hmm. whether it'll take place at a sold-out Turner's Cross or whether it may still be moved to Porky Cueve. Have you been surprised in any way by the GEA's attitude towards hosting the game? It's not for me to comment on. Um, I know it's a very sensitive issue, mm. and I think people should remember that. Um, I met Lee Miller two weeks before he died uh, in Cork. Um, I had a meeting with him. It was difficult because um, dying in public is a very difficult thing for anybody. It's not. It wasn't a private debt. It was a very public debt. Uh, it was appeared in much media outlets before he died, and he was suffering. Um, I met him. Uh, I helped him in a way the association had been significantly. We also negotiated when Celtic were playing them that we would help significantly as well. Uh, the night before our AGM, Martin O'Neill will represent his family with the caps he got for Ireland. Uh, we paid a tribute to Medivhiva Stadium, and rightfully so, as a great international footballer, great family man, a great sportsman. And even at the supporters' club night that we had recently with the Irish supporters, he was recognised, and that should be the way it is. Uh, my simple view is whatever comes within the FAI's remit to help um, the Liam Miller family, we will do. But outside of our remit, we shouldn't comment or, or get involved. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks for your time. Cheers, Ed. Thank you.